Do you have heat now? We do. It came this afternoon. Good. Oh. It was dirty. So now we're going to have to put it in a new pump. Oh, oh, oh my God. God. Well, we should actually have the hot water separated from the furnace also. Because when the furnace goes on, there's just no hot water in there. Well, we had a pre lens and shower this morning. Oh. Hey. All right. Hey. Get used to it now. I think it went out three times. Well, it was three times last month or so. <laughs> Mark, just roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another first for water. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been in a parish where the well, heat's like always going out. <laughs> but that's all right. The ladies were the more valiant ones on Tuesday morning in the chapel because it was only 48 degrees in the chapel. That's right. Oh. <laughs> but you survived, <laughs> see? You made it? Okay. You made it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. O Lord, Lord, you are the light, who shone upon those who were in darkness, and they were illuminated. Upon the blind, that they should cover their sight. Let your face now shine upon us, and we shall be illumined by you. Walk in the way of your gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Mary, pray for us. Father, the Son, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. So what we want to do here is we want to cover the last, the fourth century. So we want to cover um, the fourth century events. Of the 300. So that we have an idea then, because of course, remember, St. Mary dies in the year 410. On Tuesday, we had the feast of St. James into, into Jesus. St. James cut up, martyr of Persia. He died in 420, further east under Shah Yazdegerin. So you have an idea of what's building up here. So remember roughly in the mid 200s, early 200s, is when we already have Christianity in Odessa. So it's evangelizing that Aramaic speaking population on the maps that we looked at. Okay? And of course Christianity keeps spreading. Now in the southwestern or the south the eastern part, so the area of now the country of Jordan, around the city of Petra, and everyone knows Petra. If you don't know Petra as a name, you know the famous stone-carved treasury in the mountainside, the carved buildings, that's Petra. And so Petra in the first century becomes part, becomes a province of the Roman Empire, and it's known as Arabi Patraya. And what happens is these Bedouin people who are Arab speakers, so they're speaking, you know, the ancient uh, uh, Arabic from the peninsula. When they settle in that southeastern part and southern, what's now southern Jordan, they actually start speaking Aramaic. So they adopt the Aramaic. They're all Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. They're all cousins, of course, of the same family of languages, but they actually just adopt Aramaic. We spoke about. I don't know, probably last spring, we spoke about Palmyra. So Palmyra was supposed to be the eastern frontier, the place where ISIS blew up the main Roman the gates. They're also an Arab people. The term Arab is very large and has lots of arguments around it as to what it is. But they're considered, at least the people who live in Arabia and the southern parts of Jordan and that are, in the large sense, Arab. And then you have, because Palm, the, Pal, the Palmyrian people are also considered to be an Arab people. 
And then we saw, we saw when we left off in the history, we saw that Zenobia tried her, her attempt at being an independent kingdom and take over the rest of the Middle East from the Roman Empire and be the queen of her own empire down to Egypt. So what happens is this, the frontier, because of Persia, you know, to this day we all still have wars that go on back and forth in the Caucasus and Iraq. And if you remember in the 1980s, this great and the great bloodshed and thousands and thousands of people that were killed in the war between Iraq and Iran. So you always have this area which is a big cultural divide. And so what the Roman Empire did, and of course by this time now, we're talking in the 300s, it's Constantinople, because Rome has moved to New Rome, and it's Constantinople or, or Istanbul nowadays. And what they did is they started recruiting, the same way that in Europe they started recruiting Germanic peoples to be soldiers on the frontier. And part of the uh, encouragement was because if you would join up with the army, we'll facilitate your citizenship. You'll be part of the empire. And so people who were living on the outside of the empire, you're watching them storm the gates down in Tijuana now. You've always had the aspects of these frontiers. And so the Roman Empire, unfortunately, if you want to know history, when Rome starts doing this, it's really kind of the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire. Because it's no longer Romans who are defending the frontiers. It's basically people you've hired to defend your frontiers, which is a good indication. And historically, we know it began to kind of collapse. Because then, when those Germanic peoples in Europe, for example, settled in as soldiers and all of that, that worked out pretty well for them. But then they were like, I got cousins across the Danube, so they can come too. And so when we talk about the Germanic invasions, it's not, sometimes there were actual you know, marauding troops. But most of it was that people just kept moving. And they kept moving in. You didn't have much of a frontier. And eventually it just changes, and the administration collapses. So to avoid this in the east, what the Romans are trying to do is they start trying to settle these different Bedouin people, and they hire them up as soldiers. We'll hire you, and then you defend against these other people farther south, and we pay you. And you become Roman citizens. But to become a Roman citizen, you have to become Catholic. You have to become Christian. And so the early tribes in what's now that Jordan area south, you know, the northern part of the deserts of the Arabian Peninsula, the southeastern part, of the southern part of the Middle East, that whole area, you had Arab peoples who were adopting Nicene Orthodoxy. So now apparently not only were they adopting Christianity, they were quite orthodox about it. And when the emperor Valens, I think Valens, when he tried to impose what was called an Arianism or semi-Arianism upon them, they rebelled against him. Under Queen Mavia, okay, they had a queen, and she was the one who led them in this for the sake of orthodoxy and the sake of the Christian faith against a heretical emperor. I mentioned to you in the springtime the book by Thomas Holland, In the Shadow of the Sword. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent book to have an idea of what the heck is Islam? What is this thing? I mean, obviously, as Christians, we know that it's not a revelation given to a man sitting in a cave someplace in the late 500s. We know that. So the question is, is what is it, and why does it take over like almost everything in the midst of the 7th century? We have to remember, by the end of the 600s, so 600 years of the gospel spreading out. And, and the Arabs are part of it from the very beginning. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, on the day of Pentecost, we are told, some of the people explicitly were told, are present at Pentecost from Arabia. And they hear one of the languages speak, spoken is the ancient Arabic. So from the very beginning, this part of the world has always been part of Christianity from the beginning. So what's Islam? What the heck happened when the vast majority of the people in the Middle East were Christian? Most of the, many of them Orthodox, some heterodox, but some form of Christianity. 
What is this transformation that takes place of Islam? And why does it set the whole world on fire, quite literally? And how do the Christians wind up seeing it when it first arrives? So when you look at the thing, we have to remember that by the late 600s, over half of the Christian population of the earth was under Islamic government, which is an amazing thing to think about. Because, of course, most of the Christians in the 5 and the 600s were still in the Middle East, North Africa, the areas where the gospel had begun. Europe is still evangelizing these Germanic tribes. They're coming in, they come across the steppes, they come through northern Europe, they come across what's now Russia, and then all of that eastern European part. So they're still being evangelized, but Christianity is well established in the Middle East by the 600s. And then all of a sudden, by the end of the 600s, you have half of the Christian population under a different, well, ultimately, religion. So, how do these things happen? So Tom Holland's book is quite fascinating on this, as to where this comes from. So what we want to look at is, in the second, in the 300s now, to have an idea what is happening with the Roman Empire, and what's happening in this period of time in the Middle East that's going to lead up to the world that Mamarun is born into. So I think we left off by talking about, um, we talked about Shapur the I, 253. He invades as far as Antioch. By this time, in the late 300s, by the time of the death of, of Marin, Antioch is already sliding down. It's already, because of earthquakes, because of invasions, because of burnings, you know, it, its pinnacle was actually almost at the point when the gospel arrives in Antioch was really its pinnacle culturally and within the century even architecturally its glory was at the time when the gospel was spreading in it. And then after that through earthquakes or as we mentioned in the 250s when the Persians invade Antioch because Antioch being the major city is the place of command, it's the command post. So when there was a war with Persia, the emperors lived in Antioch. So the place you invade to smash apart, to make it more difficult, is Antioch. So Antioch is burned in the 250s. But remember, the people in Antioch were also rebelling quite often, and so you had a lot of back and forth and difficulties. Um, in the year 260, there's a second invasion of Syria by the Persians. And remember, we led all this up to these wars back and forth to talk off when we spoke about St. Ephraim being part of that emigration from the east to the west when Rome and Persia divided up that Mesopotamian area. All right, now. In the year 301, 301 is considered traditionally the year that Armenia converts right, as a people. After years of persecuting Christianity, they are evangelized from um, Cappadocia. Cappadocia is central Anatolia, so part of what's now Turkey. It looks like, I mentioned to you, it has these really strange stone formations because of the volcanic activity in that. And they're very weird. And the Cappadocians actually lived in, they're like troglodytes, they lived in the caves and built houses and churches in these rock formations. So literally troglodytes. Right. So Christianity was very, very early on rooted in that area. Your great, the great Greek theologian, Saint Gregory of Nazianzen, St. Basil, St. Gregory of Nyssa, these men are all Cappadocians, and they all live in the 300s, right? When you look at this 4th century, it's an amazing period because you have some of the most extraordinary people, and certainly for Christian thinkers on the face of the earth, and historically, who all of a sudden pop up all in the same century. It's quite amazing. And the Armenians are, no, are north and east of them. 
in the north of Syria. But of course, Armenia is mountains. And so it's always been this kind of secluded area. And Armenia throughout history has always played whatever bet served Armenia. Sometimes they were in alliance with Persia, sometimes they were in alliance with Rome, dependent on who it was. And the Armenians have also had their own form of Christianity. They're not Orthodox, like we think of the Orthodox. They're not Catholic. I mean, there are Catholic Armenians now, but that's a more recent event. So Armenia stands out because it is evangelized by the Cappadocians and by the Syrians. So it has influences, so there will be things in the Armenian faith that in Christianity that we will recognize as being Orthodox, and then we recognize also things which will be Syria, Syrian. Right? Their vestments are very Syrian-like, except they've taken the they've taken the uh, anus, the hood, head covering, and they make it a solid panel that goes around the back. So instead of having a hood coming around, they just make it a solid piece of cloth that comes off the back of your coat. And so it's, you can see the Syrian. I mentioned the Syrians influenced Ethiopia. The Syrians influenced to the north Ar Armenia. But Armenia is significant because Armenia and its conversion is the first people to convert. All right? I mean, with all due respect to the French, they don't convert for another century. So the Armenians are actually the first people. The French, the Franks, are the first people in Europe. So hence their title as eldest daughter of the church. But that's almost a century later after this takes place. And the Armenians, what's fascinating also, often also is the Armenians develop a written language because of Christianity. They are extraordinarily attached to their written language because it's unique and it was created for them to take um, what had been a non-literate language because you have to translate the scriptures. You don't have anything to trans you have, you have no written tool. And so within the, that first century, the first century and a half of their conversion, you have men who develop an entire alphabet syllabary in order to be able to record Ar Armenian. So it's quite an extraordinary. I mean, it looks like nothing else on the face of the earth. You know, you look at Ukrainian and Russia and all these Eastern Slavic Europeans, because they were evangelized by Greeks, they gave them an alphabet based upon the Greek alphabet. You know, you make up new letters for different sounds that you don't have in Greek. Same thing in Coptic. You develop the whole language to put Egyptian down, but the base, it looks very Greek-like. The Ethiopians, who knows, though it's probably Yemeni, but the Armenians develop a written word that's almost identified with their faith. And to this day, they are profoundly attached to it. So they, don't, they call themselves the Armenian Epistolic Church. They don't use the term uh, um, um, Orthodox, and they don't use the term Catholic. All right? So, like I said, there are Armenian Catholics now. But they have their own path that they follow. So they're quite a fascinating people. All right. Now we talk about this Nicene Orthodoxy. So we have the Council of Nicaea. We talked about this. Well, now we're going to talk about it in depth, and I even have a handout. Nicaea. 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 Let me see. So what happens is during the persecutions under Diocletian, a lot of people die. Starting with per capita, the largest group being the Egyptians. I think I left them upstairs. Um, we'll come back to it after the break. I mean, in 10 minutes, I'll go up and get them. And what happens is, Diocletian, the persecutions of Diocletian go on roughly from the year 285 until 313. That's a long time to be working at trying to basically practice, can't call it strictly genocide because it's not a people, but you're trying to eradicate a religion. 
out of the face of the earth. Now, we mentioned that what we should go back to is what is the precedent before this? There is probably the first Christian emperor is a man called, and he's known as Philip the Arab. And he is from Bosra, from southern Syria. If you go to Basra in southern Syria, it's a fascinating city because, of course, when the hometown boy became num numero uno in Rome, he lavished all kinds of money back on his hometown, this village, in what's now southern Syria. But what's fascinating about it is the area is built on volcanic rock. So the buildings and everything are made out of this black stone. It's quite, it's quite fascinating. But Philip the Arab, with the name Philip, Philippos, it, it's considered by many historians that he was actually Christian, because of course Syria being one of the first places that Christianity spread and spread, you know, quite wide, was, was quite widespread, universal. But the, his Christianity doesn't have any impact on what he does as emperor. He's there as, you know, the, political figure. And he's not there for very long. He's only there for five years. And then he's, he's kind of a figure in history that disappears because his successor basically has him murdered and succeeds him and then continues a propaganda to tell him why, why he was so bad. Okay? But it's at the time when what happens is this is a big influence at that point of Syrians on Rome, in the city of Rome. You know? most people don't know is that in those early centuries, in the first millennium, we actually had quite a number of Syrian popes in Rome, bishops of Rome, who were from the Middle East, from Syria. Right? Because Syria at the time was a breadbasket, and so we think of it as a big desert now, but its climate was different at the time. And it, it was one of the breadbaskets, like Egypt and Syria. And so you have this movement. So what happens then is you have persecutions under Datius in the 250s. They break out after Philip the Arab. They go on, they go on, bits and spurts around. But then when Diocletian comes in, the empire is really rocking in the late 200s, right, politically. Because you have movements of people. We don't know exactly why. Though now, because we can do better studies, like the whole, the whole field of dendrology, the study of trees, you study, you study trees and things, and you can see droughts now. So, for example, why do all these people that we call the Slavs, the Hungarians, why do they all of a sudden appear? Attila the Hun, why do these people start appearing? When we know that they're steppe people, they come on their horses, we call them Germanics, but the, why, why are these people moving? And it's very likely that you have a whole period of great droughts in Central Asia, which at that point, causes the people to have to move because they can't live where they're at. And so you have that. So there's a book by the name of Peter Frank, Franken, Franken. And Peter Franken, I mentioned to you before, Peter Franken is at, um, I think he's a professor of history at Oxford. He's a young man actually in his 30s. But he wrote a book called Silk Roads. It's like a tour de force history of the world, showing you how East and West have never been separated. They have always been intertangled. They have always been. And so these Germanic tribes are a perfect example. These are people from the East. They were neighbors with the Chinese. All of a sudden appear in Europe. The Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Huns, the Franks. All these people start appearing on the scene, and it destabilizes everything. It's, you know, women and babies are not an invasion, but when you start organizing thousands of people to amass on the border, that's the equivalent of an invasion because it's organized. You know? And so this is what's happening. It's not because the Franks or these other people were wicked or evil or whatever, but you destabilize everything because you appear and you want what everyone else already has. And that's part of what's rocking. So in Diocletian, Diocletian comes from an area basically of Yugoslavia. That's where he's born. He's not born in the Italian peninsula. He's, he's a Dalmatian. Right? That's the ancient Dalmat Dalmatia is part of what's now Slovenia, Slovakia, that area. And so <clears throat> when he comes to power, he's a brilliant man, absolutely brilliant. And what you find a lot of times is the worst emperors politically were the ones that let Christianity spread because they didn't really care. They weren't really good politically. But the other ones who are trying to keep the empire together, you know, 
The European Union can't even stay together after 50 years. And Britain's leaving. The United Kingdom's leaving. We haven't even been able to do it for 70 years, 50 years. Imagine trying to govern North Africa, most of what's Europe, most of England, or the British and Scottish Island, and then all the way to Mesopotamia. To do that and to do it for centuries. So when Diocletian comes in, it's really bad. And so he's the one who forms what's called the Tetrarch. And the Tetrarch, he goes, okay, we're going to have one guy in the east, and we're going to have one guy in the west, and they're going to be co-emperors. You watch the west, you watch the east. This is actually the beginning of the breakup culturally of the Roman Empire. But he does it because of political reasons. Then you're going to have an assistant. And the assistant is going to have the right of succession. So when you step down, then the next two guys will come in. That's going to be part of the problem. When you say, okay, Diocletian decides now, I'm going to retire and grow, go grow rutabagas back in my home country. So, which is basically in Split. Split is in, and it used to be Yugoslavia. I can't remember which country it's Croatia? in now. Is it? So it's in? Croatia. Yeah, I think it's Croatia. So, Split, you have a palace there. That was his retirement place. And his whole goal was get this thing together, do your job, and I'm going to retire. I don't want to die as emperor. But of course, then his colleague in the, in the West didn't want to step down. In the East, didn't want to step down. And so you have this problem. But the idea was you had two Augustuses, two Augusti, and their assistants carried the title of Caesar. And the idea was that when the Augustus, the Augustes would step down, the Cesari, the Caesari, would become Augusti. And it was supposed to be a nice succession. It didn't last very long because human nature being what it is. Very famously, you can see on the great basilica of St. Mark's in Venice, there is a stone in porphyry that's a corner piece of the building. It's a very famous part. I don't know where it was from originally, but it's been incorporated into the, into the church of St. Mark of the Tetrarchy. And you have two men with crowns and two men with, so you have two men on this corner, two men on this corner, and they're hugging. And so it symbolizes the Tetrarchy, how it's one unified, it was a piece of propaganda, of course. So Diocletian comes in, now he has to turn internally. This Christian thing, this, this oriental religion of these people who will not recognize Rome, they won't adore Rome, they won't pay religious homage to the emperors, they won't pay... All we're asking for is to be patriots. All you've got to do is recognize the superiority of Rome, of the genius of Caesar, all of these things. They won't do it. So these people are parasites, and they're destroying the empire. And therefore, we have to get rid of them because they are an internal cancer to the well-ordered. The empire has gone on for almost, at that point, eight centuries, right? We celebrate a bicentennial. Let's see if we make it for another 800 years, okay? As the United States of America. Not North America, but let's see if we make it as the United States. That's another question. When you do that? I remember once when I first arrived in Switzerland and did my studies, they had all these French seminarians with me. They were like, you can't consider yourself a country until you have eight centuries of history. That was their kind of a priori answer to, you know, Americans. You need this, you know. So, his idea then is that these people are internally. And the reason why in 285 what starts first is with the army. The army had laws, you know, one of the characteristics of the Romans that they prided themselves on was what was called pietas. I mean, our word piety is not the same thing. Pietas. And another characteristic was gravitas. Gravitas was the idea that we are serious and focused people. That was one of the prime Roman characteristics. When you see all Roman statues, they all look rather severe. What they're, not, what they're doing is not showing you they're mean-spirited. What they're doing is showing you we are, we are people of determination. We 
know what we need to do and we do it. Remember, one of their myths is one of their one of their myths is having a general who, in order to prove the fact of what he was doing, actually held his fire, his hand over a fire, and burned it in the enemy camp. All right? And after that, he was known as Lefty. So, I mean, quite literally, that's the story. But anyway. So, you know, these are people. So, gravitas was the idea we have determination, we have focus, we have organization, we have discipline. Pietas is the idea is we recognize our origin. The virtue of piety is not, I make the sign of the cross and genuflect a lot. The virtue of piety is I recognize origins. I recognize my parents. I recognize my nation. I recognize my family. I recognize God. That's piety. The Chinese are the other famous culture for whom piety was, was like the ultimate virtue. You recognize where you have come from. You pay homage to the past. That notion is piety. And so for the Romans, what Diocletian looks the Christians at is they are impious. They don't recognize the gods. They don't recognize the origin of Rome. They don't recognize these things because they worship some, they worship some Jewish rabbi. And so for him, they're a parasite. Now in the Roman Empire, because the empire is uh, celebrates its pietas, the Roman Empire has always required religious sacrifices in honor of the gods. But over the previous two centuries, they weren't really enforced. You go out on campaign, you offer sacrifices to the gods. You, you, forecare, you foretell the future. You have the divine, divinations that go on. When there's a campaign, you always recognize the gods for the benefits that they bring to you. But they weren't really imposed. I mean, they went on. But nobody, all the soldiers were supposed to be there and participate in these sacrifices. But they weren't being enforced. That's how it allowed so many Christians to also serve in the army. Because they didn't have to. But what Diocletian did in 285, 287 at that time is he said, you are going to implement these rules within the army. And you're going to require all the soldiers in the army, in the imperial army, to participate, showing piety, pietas, to the gods. Well, that's all of a sudden causes a huge problem. Because if you're a Catholic and you're in the army, all of a sudden now, you can imagine them at one point, human nature being what it is, right? Okay, so the sacrifices are taking place, and say, okay, we got to go out and kill some more goats. All right. So. <coughs> All right, it's going to be on Tuesday morning at 10. All right, so you all line up here. And the Christians are in their back ranks, and they're just there. They're not participating in any way. They're not offering incense. They're not eating of the sacrificial victims. They're just there. And you can imagine them kind of, you know, back in the mess hall, just kind of like, well, that was, it's amazing how these people just see by eviscerating, you know, birds and goats that it somehow tells them something about the future, you know. Yeah, you do it quietly, but human nature being what it is, you know, over a couple beers, you just kind of make fun of these things because you were born in a Christian family. Now Diocletian says you're not even just to be present, but you're going to be participating in this. And that's what begins to unleash what we call the persecution. Remember I told you the word persecution doesn't mean we string you up on the wall and flog you and then waterboard you and then flay you alive. Persecution technically means they are after you, pursuit. Constantly, sequi, sequi in Latin means to follow. Persequi means to thoroughly follow after. And you are going to be, you are Romans, and you are going to show pietas. That's the logic on how these things work. No one turns around and says, we're going to go out and kill every Christian we find. No, we're going to require everyone first in the army to show the Roman cardinal virtue of pietas. And when you refuse, it borders on treason. Because you will not honor your origins. You will not honor the gods. Okay, it's the logic, right? We are living in the same period of history that that kind of logic is very much surrounding us. You're going to be, well, even in America, culturally, you're going to be, you're going to be crushed and suffocated by a logic that's coming in. But you have to have complete clarity of thought. And I told you, in the persecution of the Diocletian, most historians think the majority of Catholics, the majority of Christians collapsed and apostatized. We 
renounce their faith in some manner. It's pretty horrific. Okay? The human nature doesn't change. So, we'll take a brief break. A, a brief break. I'm going to go up and get these sheets on the front. Okay. Caffeine. Right? No. The sugar. No. The main arguments for the Romans is they don't care what religion you worship, but you have to recognize as your origin Rome. Rome has to be supreme. Okay? So it's the Romans don't really care about Christianity or Judaism or anything else. They don't really care what you want to worship. But you have to see as supreme Rome, the divinization of Rome, the, the genius, the spirit behind Caesar. And the problem with the Christians and the Jews is that they were exclusive on recognizing their God. And to the Romans, that was completely bizarre. Why would you say your God is the only God? It doesn't make... The notion of being a single divinity as an origin of all things just wasn't part of their minds. Pagans don't think that way. If you go to China, you have discussions. They have no notion of creation and an origin. They have an idea that things have always been this way. It's why, hello, when I think you're looking for an AA, where are they at now? Where are they meeting? You? I don't know where they're meeting. Where do they go? Where does AA go now? They haven't been here in a couple of years. Oh, uh, it's at the REM building, and then some random people told me it was here. I'm really sorry. Well, no, 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 no. The REM building is right around the corner. To, it used to be here for a long time, but it's been well over a year now. Okay. But but I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what building there is, though. The REM building is around the corner. You yeah, oh, REM building is on Temple yeah, Street. I think that's where they it's are. It's on what? Temple it's on Street. Temple Street. Okay. Does it say it on the building? It's yeah, shy. it's right right where the Chinese restaurant is. It's yeah. right there. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. you. All right. So this is what the Romans held against the Christians, and to an extent the Jews. The reason why the Jews don't come into the same persecution is the Jews are considered exempt by Roman law. They're an ancient people, they predate the Romans, and so the Romans give them, they, have, they, are, they govern themselves by their own law. They're not governed by the same laws as other Roman citizens because of the recognition of the ancientness of the people. But the Christians, though, don't have any of that. For them, this is a novelty. They worship, they worship someone who was executed in the first century by the Roman Empire, and they're just weird. All right? They're weird because they want this dead rabbi to be the only god in the universe. And so for them, it's bizarre. It's why when you read the lies, when you read the questions of martyrdom, again and again and again in testimony, the martyrs tell the Roman judges, I worship the God who made heaven and earth. That's not a concept that the Romans or pagans have. The idea is it's just always been here. Maybe it's changed and shifted, but it's just always been here. And so you continue, and when you realize what is going on in the Romans' mind, you understand why continually, St. Agnes, St. Agatha, all of these martyrs in giving testimony to the God that they worship as I am the God, I worship the God who made heaven and earth. God who is the origin of all things. Okay, it's an important point. So anyways, this goes on and then after that, then Diocletian has it expanded among the civilian population. And you will all go and participate in the sacrifices. And you have to receive your certificate showing your authorization. So we've talked about that, I know. And so, by the year 313, now what happens is in the East, the persecutions are horrible, especially in Egypt, because Egypt was always trying to be out of the Roman Empire anyway. And they had already been part of the empire for a century, a century and a half, well, two centuries at this point, which for them is a recent blop in history. You know, other than that, we were the great pharaohs, the great empire that went on for thousands of years. We don't want it simply just to be a granary for, for Rome. So the Egyptians have always been on the out, so to speak. They've always wanted to be out of the empire. And at the same time, of course, Christianity had spread enormously throughout um, Egypt. So Egypt is probably per capita the place of the entire Roman Empire that suffers the most. To the point where it's so pathetic, a lot of the pagans start fighting their Christian friends. Because it's so bloody, it's so um, violent. 
And in the East, in general, it's violent because one, I think the Caesars, his mother was a priestess. She worked at some temple for some god or goddess, who knows what. And so she's egging on her son, who's one of the emperors. And so he's quite happy to oblige mom. And so they just work. The East is horrible. In the West, it's not as bad. There are some people who die under Diocletian, but it's more around, say, the Italian peninsula. Because the Caesar in the West was Constans Chlorus. Why he's called Constans the Green, I have no idea. But that's Constantine's father. Now, Constan Constans is a pagan. But by this time, many pagans worshipped one god. They worshipped the sun. Right? They worshipped the sun. And for them, they didn't, they, the other gods, they didn't deny them, but they were moving towards what we call henotheism. Henotheism is different from monotheism. Monotheism means there's only one divinity. Henotheism means that for me there's only one divinity. They don't deny that Aphrodite exists or Venus or whatever. They don't really care. They just worship the sun. But they don't, to the point of exclusion of others, they just don't really, it just doesn't, it doesn't phase them in their religious life. Okay? That's what the Romans wanted the Christians to be. Recognize whatever you want as being your supreme god, but do not refuse the other gods. And of course, they didn't refuse Rome. And so, Constance Chlorus is married to Helena. And Helena, of course, famously, her boy, her baby boy, is Constantinus. And Chlorus is, uh, Constance Chlorus, is, as he's moving up the whole hierarchy politically, he loves Helen. He marries another woman, because Helen's low birth. So he marries a senatorial woman, which the Romans... Romans married and divorced all the time for political reasons and reasons for inheritance. You know, they, they were quite free with this. For them, it was a political alliance or simply a domestic relationship for inheritance. So he set Helena aside, divorced her, and married a senator into the senatorial family because he's moving up politically. But he loves Helena, and he always takes care of her. So her household is always well furnished, she makes sure she's well fed, she's kept at a good status, she's comfortable, because of course, she's also rearing my boy, Constantinus. But Helen is a Christian. So, because he loves her, this is the power of one person can have. She's faithful as a Christian, and her husband loves her, and she's a devoted mother. <laughs> And because she's a Christian, all those things take on a different light. So it also means that when Constans is receiving these directives from Rome to eradicate Christianity, he never enforces it. France, England, he's in England. What's now England? He's in England. When Constantine is declared emperor by the troops, it's in what's now York, England. I mean, this shows you what kind of thing the Roman Empire was. One moment we're talking about Mesopotamia, and now we're talking about your kingdom. The Romans were absolutely extraordinary. So, Constans never really imposes. He doesn't refuse it if some of the local... And there were people who died who were martyred, because if local governors were more zealous, he can't stop them, because it is the law. But he's not going to make all the governors impose this. That's what happens. So when Constantine comes and is declared as the new Augustus, for the West, taking over his father's position in York, England, he makes an alliance with the Eastern version of the emperor. And the first thing they do is we're going to have freedom of conscience. That's the Edict of Milan in 313. They agree that what we're going to do, because at this point you've had almost 30 years of, of people dying everywhere. You know, at this point, the empire, historians estimate that at the time when this all started, probably about 10% of the empire, not, not in one location, because obviously there were more in the Middle East and in Egypt and North Africa, but in general, the general population, probably 10% was Christian overall. Okay? 
and he's trying to eradicate that. It's not working. Constantine loves his mom. She's a Christian. And so he, he thinks this is, this is not the way to do this. We've tried to do this for 25 years, trying to exterminate these people. This isn't working. They're not giving in. And all you're doing is causing chaos everywhere, domestically, socially. And so they agree that we're going to give what's called the Decree of Milan, because Milan now, it's not the city of Rome. The Western Empire is being governed from Milan. And that's an important point because when Augustine, St. Augustine is in Milan, he's there because that's the, that's the actual political capital of the West, not Rome anymore. Rome is just kind of falling apart. They move away from it. Okay? So what happens here is they give a declaration. People will say, well, Constantine made the empire Christian. He didn't. He didn't. In fact, Constantine personally only is baptized literally like two months before he dies. He spends his whole political career, but he does it as a man of justice, trying to make reparation. That's why the Vatican, St. John Lateran, these places in Rome are built. They're part of acts of making reparation for the people who for 25 years have been despoliated, have been killed, have been imprisoned, have been maimed, and put in slavery. And so he gives his palace to the Roman church. That's St. John Lateran's to this day. That area is where Constantine's house was. At the edge of town, along the wall, nice location, quiet, not from the chaotic city center. And so he gives it. It was the Lateran Palace. His mother Helena, she gives her palace, which is like right down the street from the two of them. Okay? These are acts of reparation, and he requires the, the judges to make reparation for the losses, the unjust losses of property that were confiscated during this time. That's what begins happening in the three and the tens. You have all the problems politically, and in the end what happens is the eastern version of the empire, they decide, because he's still the pagan, we're not going to honor this, and they start unleashing persecutions again. Wind up having the conflict between Constantine and his eastern colleague, and they have a civil war. Constantine comes out as number one. We're not doing Tetrarchy anymore. I'm the only one. If you go to Rome to this day, you've all seen pictures of the Colosseum. Next to the Colosseum, there is an arch. This also tells you what's going on culturally. This arch is a hodgepodge of cannibalized pieces from other previous older monuments in Rome. So the sculptures are not really all proportioned. Some of the medallions in there. But it was built, it was commissioned by the Senate to commemorate the great conquest and victory of Constantine at the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome, the famous battle that the night before he's supposed to have seen the sign of the cross in the sky. And he says, in this sign you will conquer, fighting his pagan colleague. I mean, he's still pagan also, but he's trying to favor injustice, the Christian population. And they put, we don't know exactly what he put on it, whether it was the key row, the PX, the key row, or if it was an axe for Christos in Greek, or some form, or also being the cross. But he has the soldiers put it on, they fight at the bridge, he has a victory on that point, he becomes the sole governor of the entire empire at this point. And so the Senate is like, ooh, good. Remember, the Senate is mostly pagans. These are conservative people. They're, they're still senatorial families, they're pagans. They worship the gods. But you can't ignore the fact this guy's in charge now. So the Senate votes to commission a monument for this great unification politically of the whole empire, and they build this monument, which is still standing there. Okay. This is the beauty of when you can see these things physically. But what happens in the Senate now? What are you going to inscribe on it? Thanks be to Jesus for uniting the pagan empire of Rome. That's not going to work. You're going to alienate most of the population. What are you going to put down? Thanks be to God, thanks be to Zeus for bringing victory to the empire. That's going to alienate Constantine and his mother. So what, we are not going to put that down. So what they do is that it's inscribed to the divine genius. So the, it's basically a monument to the divinity. 
So it's a fascinating monument there because it is so modern. Right? We all worship the same God. You call her Aphrodite. You call it Jesus. You call it Allah. Well, it's all the same God. Let's just get along here. That's what the Senate is doing at this time. And for the next century, when the senators would come into the Senate chambers, there was a statue of Nike, of Victoria, of victory. And they would offer incense as they came in that she would watch over all the deliberations of the empire. But for the next century, that statue is not taken down all their ceremonies for another 80 or 90 years. Because you have this whole push and shove back and forth. And in the midst of these 300s, who's born? Gregory of Nazianzen, Gregory of Nyssa. And you have all the evangelization of the Armenian people. In 301, while the Roman Empire is trying to kill and eradicate its Christian population, the Armenian king and the Armenians say, we embrace the gospel as a people. That's pretty glorious. It's also a way of showing we're not like these Romans. It's to show their independence. So there's, oh no, there's a psychological aspect that goes on with it also. All right. Any questions? You said Piro. How did you pronounce it? Piro. When we grew up around here, we had what we called the Cairo shop on Main Street. Yeah. That was our religious store. Remember the Cairo but shop? But this yeah. letter is key. Yeah. That's why it's, when you write it out, it becomes Christos. Oh. This is a, this is the rule. So it's what well, it's where we get our ch chi, rho, yota, sigma, tau, omicron, and c. Christos. We did at one time had a very nice religious shop on Main Street. <laughs> well, that's where it's named for. So when you call, so when you see this emblem, this is a combination of the first two letters, chi, and then rho. We talk about a px, but it's not px. It's a hero, chi, rho, for the name of Christ. So we don't know exactly what they put on their she on the banners for this battle, but it might be that. Uh, it might be just an X, because the X is the original form of, trying, of showing the cross. But it's probably not that, because no one would want to have that on their cross, because it was like the most hideous way to be executed. So it's very likely that it's this. So, <clears throat> thank you. So what happens is that this church is in disarray. And what happens is, is once they allow the church to be liberated and free, what happens? Well, within the church, everyone starts arguing. Now that you're not trying to kill us, now we'll try to kill each other. So there's all this fighting that goes on. And Constantine is kind of taken back. It's like, look, you, you have total political freedom now. Why are you trying to do each other in? Because what happens at the same time, this is going to be the beginning that's going to lead up to all the fractures in the year 451. For the next 150 years, now that you're legal, well, what are we legally then? How do we express it? What do you put down? What are our corporate bylaws? <laughs> now that we're actually legal, how are we going to define what we are? Well, coming out of Egypt, the great Egypt, an ally, ally with Rome, you have one of the parish priests there. His name is Arius. A-R-I-U-S. Arius. Intelligent, ascetic, cultured, one of the main churches in Alexandria, he became a priest late. He was probably in his late 50s, early 60s, when he was ordained. But he, he gives an explanation. So who is Jesus? And so his teaching is that Jesus, and this is how most heresies take place. You try to give an explanation which makes sense to me of the eternal and infinite hidden one, okay? So you're probably going to screw up someone, right? Because if it makes sense to me, how is my little pea brain going to wrap around the infinite, eternal, hidden one? But we do it all the time, and we do it in every generation. You've heard lots of your colleagues talk about their version of Christianity probably for these decades. 
Oh, well, this is, you don't need to believe that. You don't need to believe that. Oh, that's silly. You still believe that? That's how this works. And Arius then gave to the erudite and educated classes in very wealthy Alexandria, one of the main cities of the world. This is New York City. This is one of the main cultural places. You know. And so his explanation was that Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus does save us. But Jesus is obviously not the same thing as God. He's born in Bethlehem. Right? They didn't do hysterical Christmas like we do in the manner that we do it now. But everyone knows the story that this person was born. If you're born, how, what happened before? If you're God, how can you be God and be born? So for him, the idea was is that the Word, because the question is, is what is the Word? Because we talk about that the Word was made flesh. So the question becomes, well, what is the Word? So the Word, if the Word becomes flesh, it, it has the ability to change. And God in itself is, does not change. And so because of that reason then, you have this idea then that where there was a time, he simply gives in his teaching, there was a time when the Logos, when the Word did not exist. And of course, for people then, they go, well, this makes sense. This is something which is given. Someone who comes to the earth, he is divine, but he's not the one God. You have people who believe this today. Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the doctrine. Mormons. That's the doctrine. The idea is that Jesus is like number two, but there's only one eternal God. And so there's a time when the word doesn't exist, when the word is brought into creation, but it ultimately is a creature who God uses, whom God uses as an instrument to make the world. All right? And so, of course, a lot of people in Alexandria, well, that makes sense, finally. They kept talking about this Jesus guy as being God, the eternal God. How can he be the eternal God when he's born to a woman in Bethlehem? And so the idea, then, is that the Word, in the Gospels of St. John, the Word is the greatest and the first of all of God's creation. It's influenced by the, the philosophies that are at the period of time. But the idea is he's trying to put it into a contemporary um, mode of expression in philosophy that was prevalent around that area in the Greek world and Alexandria in this, and trying to put it in a mode which is not only culturally acceptable, but also sufficient for the people in the pews to think, okay, I got it, I really understand who Jesus is. And so it made sense. Well, of course, you have an immediate reaction. You have a reaction from his bishop. You cannot teach them. The word is God. No. Because what happens is, is so the scripture says itself, the, the practice of the church has always been Jesus is God. Jesus is the revelation of the eternal God. He is God. I and the Father are one. He says it in the gospel. But what you emphasize at the beginning of St. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right. Arius says, well, look, it says he was with God. Therefore, they are distinct beings. And so the Word now in Arius' doctrine is that this is the great, and he's the creator. In the philosophy at the time, it was referred to as the demiurge. E-M-I-U-R-G-E, uh, Demiurge. And the Demiurge was the creator of the material world, of the maker. But he was not the divinity which was hidden and unseen. Okay? So as a result, what happens is this now causes great controversy. And at the time, you have a young deacon who's in the church of Alexandria, whose name is Athanasius. Now, he's a young deacon. He's probably only in his around 30, 32 or so. But he's brilliant. He's well-educated. And he sees immediately that this catechism going on at this parish is totally out of the tradition of, of the Christian church. And he publicly, he publicly denounces it. 
right? They did not, there was none of this kind of mamby-pamby dancing around saying, well, yes, but you know, he means well. No, what he is teaching is completely not Christian doctrine. And so it causes this clash. Now you have this controversy going on, and in this controversy, then the question becomes, well, how are we going to resolve this? So you start having synods, and the bishops meet together to discuss how do we articulate this, what is the logos, what is this word, and what is this? So there are regional conferences that go on, these synods, but in the end, you still have this controversy going on, because you have a lot of bishops in the East, remember? A lot of them are in the Hellenic culture. So for them, the idea of philosophizing to give it something which is understandable makes perfect sense. So a lot of the bishops in the classical world, in this Hellenic world, actually say, well, what's wrong with that? Which makes it even more horrifying. And so Athanasius, what happens then is, is Constantine is like totally shocked that this is going on. Why? Because because in his pagan mind, it's like, well, who cares? I mean, you are arguing over a word. You are arguing over what is the logos. It's like, come on, come on. Surely you can get together and agree on something. Just compromise everybody. And of course, the Orthodox fathers like, there's nothing to compromise on. Jesus is the revelation of God. What do you want? Word is God. So this revelation. So what then Constantine says is, okay, I want an imperial conference for everyone to come together and you're going to discuss this, and you're going to hash this out. This is the Council of Nicaea in 325, okay? That's what this thing is. That's why it stands out in such an important point, because it's the first time from, really, the Council of the Apostles, when they had to decide, what do we do with pagans? And they just enter in equally through baptism, like the Jewish population, into the Gospel. So in the Acts of the Apostles, we have what we call the Council of Jerusalem or the Council of the Apostles in a loose sense. But they got together to discuss what are we supposed to do with these people who are converting coming from a pagan background. And so this is kind of the same thing. And of course, the church has always governed itself synodally. You have annual meetings and you govern and the bishops get together, the priests get together, and they discuss and they lay out directives, they lay out clarifications of doctrine, and this is one of them, except now this is going to be the empire. And this is where we get the word ecumenical. In the Greek, the word ecumene, Ecumene was the idea of the civilized world. And so, of course, being good Romans, the civilized world was us, and everybody outside of us are barbarians, like the Greeks thought before them, and like most people think. All right? So, <coughs> ecumene means the civilized world. So, when you have an ecumenical synod or ecumenical council, it means everyone is being represented here, the whole church, east, west, north, south, everyone's here. What happens is there are about 350, 375 bishops who meet in Nicaea, in Nicaea, in 325. Right. There are two priests who are sent from the Pope in Rome to represent him in these discussions. And the young deacon, Athanasius, he's ready for a fight. And he's one of the main voices in this council denouncing Arius. Right. It goes back and forth, there's huge arguments, lots of fights, and it's an enormous thing. That was the Arian heresy, right? That's right. So we wind up calling, once you make a decision on a council, that it becomes the official teaching, if you oppose it, you're in opposition to the official teaching of the Church of Christ. Because you're choosing to not follow it. You're going to make up something else. You're going to pick and choose. The word herios in Greek, herios, herios means choice. And so hereticos is a chooser. A heretic is a chooser. They decide what they're going to pick out of the book, out of the catechism. And they're going to believe this, and they're not going to believe that. They're going to believe this. Now, as a canonical situation, a heretic, that's a heretic in the loose sense. 
And if you question a lot of Catholics these days, probably most people are heretics. Because they just don't really know what the doctrine is. And they kind of make it up as they go along. But that's our fault, because we haven't really been teaching. And so, but what a technically a heretic is, is someone who not only knows that they're choosing something which is not the official doctrine, but who does so pertinaciously. In other words, they've been corrected by the authorities, they explain it to them again, and in the end they still, at this point, willfully stand in opposition to the, that's what magist, the magisterium, when we use the word magisterium, the word magister in Latin means teacher, where our masters of philosophy or masters of science, magister means teacher. Magisterium is the teaching authority. That's all the magisterium means. And in the church, we have always believed that there is an official, authentic connection, generation to generation, teaching in the name of Jesus, in the place of Jesus, extension of Jesus, generation after generation, and that is the authentic apostolic magisterium. Right? That's the name of magisterium. So when the teaching authority has now declared that the word is divine, is God. And you knowingly say no. And then you're corrected, in this case with Arius, quite publicly. And you still say no, and then you go around politically writing letters to get bishops on your side. Then you cause not only more confusion, but you now cause a schism. Because you all look, I have this bishop and that bishop and that bishop and that bishop and this bishop and this bishop and this bishop. And then it's going to be, well, I have more bishops than you do, so see, we're in more agreement, so we're right and you're wrong. Which, of course, the church has never argued from. St. Jerome famously in the late 300s wrote, he said that the world woke up one day and groaned to find itself Aryan. Because probably 80% of the bishops in North Africa or in the Middle East throughout the whole Hellenic world, probably embraced Arianism at some point. It never influenced the European bishops or the North Africans so much. And they didn't really understand why all this argument was going on, because they weren't into all this philosophizing that the Hellenic you know, world, what's logos and this, and, and the different cultural aspects. But Arius winds up opposing. So he becomes clearly the first one to carry, in a very clear way, the term heretic. You are a picker and a chooser, you refuse the official teaching authority, and you do so pertinaciously. And so he's deposed. He's removed from his parish, he's removed from his teaching authority, and that's when he begins to try to gather up bishops. And then it becomes mudslinging. And so now Constantine's even more confused because this seems to be worse than what we started with. So then he says, all right, forget it. This is the official Christianity. We're not going to bicker about this forever. This now becomes law, and he makes of Nicaea these declarations, the law of the Roman Empire. If you are a Christian, this is the Christian teaching, and you will follow it. So when you stand against the emperor, you are a traitor. When you stand against the church now, you are a heretic, and you will be exiled. That's why we talk about the heterodox forms of Christianity you found along the desert regions of the East. When they're exiled, you just send them off to the Black Sea. Send them off, you know, the whole thing about Crimea and the Ukrainians and the Russians recently. That was the area where you got sent in the exile, the north of the Black Sea. What was up there? Horsemen and grass and fields and, you know. So it was outside the ecumenic. Just get out of here. And so people were exiled. And so that is what you wind up having over the next 300s, is the, the argument. Because what's going to happen is after Constantine, you're going to have emperors who are in charge of armies who are going to say, no, 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 but Arius was actually right. And they're going to repudiate Nicaea, change the laws of the empire for that reason, and then start persecuting the Orthodox. This is why... John Chrysostom or others, or Athanasius. Athanasius is sent into exile, I think, no less than five times. Comes back, thrown away, gone for years, come back again, people cheering in the streets, okay, next emperor, out you go again. <laughs> right? So, you know, these are not, you know, 
People are going, oh, you know, it's horrible in the Catholic Church. We have all this confusion. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> we are nowhere near what in periods of time we have had within the Catholic Church. Right now, everyone's trying to be polite, officially. But it's seething. It's waiting. And I would like to know, my consolation on my death boot would be there's a little handful, a pocket of people in central Maine who will know the authentic apostolic teaching <laughs> that we are heirs to of our patrimony. So that when I'm moldering in the grave, I at least have the consolation to know there will be some who will know to say, no, that's not right, that's goofy. You know, and you can do it with a bit of humor, but in the end, it's quite serious. And in the end, Arius, his bishop was even praying to get rid of this guy. And Arius, in his triumph with all these bishops, right, St. Jerome complaining because the vast majority of bishops in the East of actually, that's a true doctrine, wound up, was being carried in triumph as he was back in, I think, Alexandria. Carried in triumph, and as he's being carried in triumph, he, I don't know what was wrong with him, but his bowels just kind of burst. Ah, what? Like Herod, it's the way Herod died, from whatever kind of internal something or other going on. And you just kind of ooze and break up and... Oh. Yeah, that's pretty disgusting. But that's the way Herod, you know, that's the way, that's the way Herod died. Okay? So, so the doctrine is coming out. This is why the creed that we recite every single day to this day the basic explanation within it is the Nicene Creed. It's developed later in the 300s. Okay. So, let me make sure we got all these points. Uh. Now, you have the second one you note there is, well, let me just finish up. I have a few points. So, let me give you a little more details then. So not only is it 325, it's from May 20th to August 25th in 325. And so because it was an official gathering, this is the first, this is actually a beautiful detail. And, and next week we'll be celebrating a feast day. Next week? Yeah. Not here. Next week. Yeah, here. No, I mean, not, we're not having class next week. No, 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 no. A feast. I didn't say we're celebrating. No, we're going to be singing next week, right? Next week's the first time. The 5th, 5th, 12th, and the 19th. La, 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 la. So, you, you put down for Wednesdays. Did you want Wednesdays? You put down the date was Wednesday. Yep. The date you gave for choir practice was Wednesday. Okay, that's fine. Good. You get into the practice of coming back to church. No, 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 no. All right. Back to Nicaea. <laughs> so because it was official, the empire paid for all of these men to travel to. Nicaea is in Anatolia, of course. It's, um, it's not very far from what's now Istanbul, but, but it's across the strait on the Asian side, uh, a little bit in, inland. And they just found it again. Now, they never lost it. I mean, they may have found ruins, but the city still exists. No, 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 but the actual church where the council Oh, the council. maybe, yeah. Okay, so the thing here is that, remember, this is 325. The Edict of Mon is 313. That's only 12 years. And so when this meeting takes place, and you call all of these bishops back from their positions to come in here, remember that what takes place here, there are a number of things. The first thing you want to note in Nicaea is on what is called the consubstantiality People are like, why do we use this word? Why do we use this word? Because everyone fought over it for 150 years. So we use it in English, the word consubstantial. But the word is exactly the same substance as the eternal hidden father. I mean, that we're taking from the Latin. So that's the first thing. The word is consubstantial with the Father. Everyone agrees that the Father is the eternal God. It's a condemnation of the choice, the heresy of Arius. Now, this was the, let me say that. Oh. This is the council also that decided, because this question came up a few weeks ago, 
why don't we celebrate Passover and the resurrection at the same date? I mean, after all, we know that our Lord died at Passover. Why aren't we always celebrating at the same date on the calendar? It's in Nicaea when that practice was actually prohibited forever. Because there must have been some local churches that were doing that. They were celebrating, especially in Mesopotamia, remember the Jewish Christianity, they were celebrating um, the Feast of Our Lord's Death and Resurrection on the 14th of Nisan, on Passover itself. Nicaea did not want ever our Lord's Resurrection to be celebrated in conjunction with the old Passover. One, it confuses the old law and the new law. And two, as far as the church is concerned, the people who hang on to the law of Moses in opposition to the Messiah transform the law of Moses into an act of idolatry. Because they make that law, circumcision, don't eat lobster, this type of thing, they make it in opposition to the Messiah. And so it's an act of idolatry since the Messiah is God. You're erecting something in opposition. Okay. Doesn't mean you can't love them, but you know, it's important to understand religiously what you're talking about. So the Council of Nicaea is the one which prohibited. And that's where the determination of the first Sunday of the full moon of the spring equinox. There will always be, because the 14th of Nisan will just move around. That means you had some churches that were celebrating the resurrection on Tuesday. So the first Sunday. And they said, so it's the first Sunday of the full moon of the spring equinox. Now, everyone knows that canon. Everyone knows that law. The question is, is how do you read it calendrically? And the reason being is that the spring equinox, of course, from that point on, the days are longer than the nights. In general, in the northern hemisphere, right? So the idea then is that you wanted at that point to celebrate and to show the domination of light over darkness that we celebrate in the resurrection of God incarnate. Okay? So it's the Sunday, that's the day of the resurrection. That is the mysterious of the Ogdalad. That is the great day of mystery, the eighth day, the first day of creation, the eighth day of the new redemption, and the eighth day as a sacramental representation of the hidden God that we call heaven. Okay? So all that is the Sunday. And on the Sunday then, which follows the full moon of the spring equinox, because now we're going to be having more than 12 hours of light. Okay? Now, the detail that I wanted to give you was that the bishops who came in, a number of them had marks of the tortures that they had suffered while they were in prison under Diocletian. Remember, it's only 12 years. So if you were a bishop and you were only 45, you could very much still be alive in 60, 62. And so some of these men coming into this council at Nicaea were hobbled. Because what you did when you were sent to the mines as a slave for the Roman Empire is they would take out your right eye and they would cut one of your tendons. So you could still walk, but you're not going to be able to run. And we don't need chains. Okay? So you have men, these, these priests, these bishops, who came into this council of Nicaea with a scarred up tissue on one eye and limping because they had been hobbled and had been working in the mine, say, in Gaza or in other places. And, you know, what I mentioned about the feast day next week, and the December 6th, of course, is St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas of Myrda had been in prison under the persecutions of Diocletian. We don't have a record of him being sent to the mines and crippled in that way. But he was certainly a confessor of the faith and had been in prison under Diocletian and shows up here. This is a bit like at the Second Vatican Council when the great patriarch Joseph Slippy, Archbishop Slippy, appeared after 15 years in the Gulag. They thought he was dead as they're making decisions about the Ukrainian and Russian churches under the Ostpolitik of Pope Paul VI, and Slippy shows up at this council. Slippy is a very great man, 
very, very great man. He suffered tremendously. He's one of the great confessors of the 20th century. But that would be the similar reaction to see the number of men who came in, hobbled, blinded, or in some way maimed from being in prison, tortured under it. You know, they, had, they had no Geneva Convention in those days, so they'll do whatever they want to a prisoner. And remember, Rome never imprisoned you for life. You were sent off to do something. You were enslaved in some way. Or you were executed. All right? So um, you also had out of Egypt one uh, St. Paphnutius. But St. Nicholas was also there. So you had a number of the saints that are there. Um, all right. The reason why Arius started gathering up in the east is because that's where he was sent to exile in Palestine. Before. So his return to Alexandria was because of his political coup with all these different priests and bishops trying to get him in a political society. All right? So the opposition, because of this whole, we start the fourth century with opposition about God. You spend the next decades arguing over, well, we know our practice, spirit, word, father. How do they relate? I mean, we've always worshipped them all as God. That's just the way the church has been. That's what's beautiful about the Syriac tradition is it always finishes trinitarianly. They never do, and you know, and so we thank you, Heavenly Father, through your Son and in the Holy Spirit. The Latins always do. There's nothing wrong with that. But the Syrians always insisted on the equality of the three persons. You go into an Ethiopian church, they will portray the Trinity as three old men sitting on thrones. That's just the represent. It's in the cathedral of Adi Sababa. They're over the front, over the sanctuary. Father, Son, and Spirit, because they're all exactly the same consubstantial one reality of the divinity. All right. So it's it's fascinating when you go from the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. You're, try, you're emphasizing the relations within the Trinity. But of course, as far as the person on the ground is concerned, it's not a theological question. This is how God reveals himself as this triune person, as Father, Son, and Spirit. Because by the end of the century, there's going to be a whole group of people saying, the Spirit is not God. The Spirit is the force, the divine power, something you tap into. Right? That's also a very modern idea. Right? Uh, I pray because it just makes me feel so empowered. It's like, that's not what the Holy Ghost is. It's not what the Spirit of God is. It's God. He's God. And so, by the end of it, that's going to give you your counsel in 381. They're to condemn what's called Macedonianism. Macedonia, you know, north of Greece. That's, it gets its name because that's where the main faction was coming out of. Uh, but the actual main leader was Macedonios coming out. So it's not about geography, it's about a person. All right? So that's why it's so important that the men, the troglodytes who were living in Cappadocia, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzen, St. Basil, and these other writers is throughout these decades in the 300s when Christianity is legalized, they are trying to articulate what is orthodox, magisterial, authentic Christian expression. That's why these men are gigantic. In fact, in the Byzantine church, you have a Sunday dedicated just to them because of what they did in those 300s. These were not men who went home and said, well, you know, it's too bad everyone's fighting. I'll pray that we have peace. No, they went to say, how should this be expressed so it is conformed to the tradition of the church, our liturgical practices, because the liturgy teaches us, and conformed also, obviously, to the scriptures. And that's what St. Gregory of Nazianzen writes on the Trinity, and beautifully. He also writes his poet, he also writes his theology in part in poetry, just like Ephraim and the Syrians. So it's a very fascinating period of time of these 300s. When we come back in March, we will go into the books, and we'll leave just one detail of what takes place in the middle of these 300s under the Emperor Julian. It's a very important thing that takes place.
So Constantine only winds up, he builds in 330 the city of New Rome. It is glorious, it is magnificent, and he dies there, being baptized, I think in Palestine or Caesarea someplace, just shortly before he dies. But he only becomes <coughs> Christian towards the end. When Constantine dies in 335 or 336, the, the empire is not Christian. But Christianity is growing by leaps and bounds. In Geneva, they had had one big church in 300. During the 4th century, they built another big church. We have, you can walk, you have foundations, you see these places. Because what seems to have happened is the population, Christian-wise, exploded in the 300s, because you could do this now. And you had teachers who could teach you clearly, so you had this explosion of baptisms taking place. So what it's thought is that you had one church for the liturgy, for those who were already Christians, and then one church was basically a lecture hall. Because you have an amble out in the middle of it. There was a, like a, a, an elevated walkway. So you could walk out into the middle of the crowd in this building and catechize them. All in the period of the 300s. You have to remember the power of God and what is going on in the church. And don't just wring your hands saying, gosh, there's nobody in the pews. God can change any heart at any time as long as those who have already embraced the gospel our faith, who communicates if it's not by that fidelity? So it's a beautiful thing to see in Geneva. Um, anyway, so we will finish with our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, you are for all ages, and in this age to age, you are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth life and give us each day. O radiant day and source of all life, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayers. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Son. To him with you in the Holy Spirit, be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving. Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, world down and in the end. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us, and our recourse to you. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You have a good evening. We'll see you again, but we'll see you before that.